this is Anita Boule, and I hope you are having a most marvelous day. And I truly hope that all is well with you and your family. So today, I'm following up on a video that I did a few months ago, in which I entitled it, If Only We Had Followed Booker T. Washington's Advice. And you cannot do a real study of Booker T. Washington without talking about Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. And someone asked me if I was going to discuss that debate, and I did say I would do it in a later video. And so now I'm going to do it. And I'm entitling the video, Booker T. Washington or Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, which one was right? It would take a lot of time to do a deep study of each man because each man is complex in his own way. But this is a contrast between the two. I think it's fair to say that no real study of African American history is complete without examining the rivalry between these two men. Now, I think that I will start out by saying that as a youngster, I lean towards Dr. Du Bois's idea about Pan-Africanism, liberalism, civil rights, and we want everything that we want right now. But as I have grown and learned, I have developed a tremendous respect for what Booker T. Washington was able to accomplish. It's hard for black people to get anything done now. How much more so must it have been in 1896? We do have to examine both men's lives to talk a little bit about their background to see how they came to believe what they believed. Both of these men were educated and both were brilliant. They both care about the progress of African American people. They just differed in how they thought that progress should be made. Their upbringings informed their evolution as grown men. Booker T. Washington was born enslaved in 1856 or somewhere thereabout. W.E.B. Du Bois was born in 1868 after slavery ended in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Booker T. Washington being brought up on a slave plantation and seeing the power of white supremacy at work from the time he was born understood the mind of a southern white man. He also understood how to interact with them. W.E.B. Du Bois was brought up in a racially integrated environment in Massachusetts where whites had a more tolerant attitude toward black people. So that accounts for the difference in approach, how they could both look at the same problem and see different ways of solving it. So if I were going to give each man a two-word description for Booker T. Washington, I would say realist doer. For W.D.E.B. Du Bois, I would say idealist talker. So sticking just with the facts, let's talk accomplishments. Booker T. Washington pulled himself up by his bootstraps paid his way through Hampton Institute. He graduated from Hampton Institute having earned the respect of Hampton's president, General Samuel Armstrong. In 1881, General Armstrong recommended that Booker T. Washington go to Tuskegee, Alabama to lead a non-existent institution. He had to build that institution with the students and the people of Dallas County from the ground up. They turned it into a self-sustaining community in which they grew, they raised, and they built what they needed. Having done this in such a short period of time, he drew the attention of politicians, philanthropists, and educators. Some of the richest men in America came to Tuskegee to see the wonder that he had created, and they donated generously to his cause. By 1900, Booker T. Washington was the most influential African American in the United States. He was an advisor to presidents. He was the first African American person to be invited to the White House to dine with the president, Theodore Roosevelt. Certainly Roosevelt received backlash from the white public, but the fact of the matter is Booker T. Washington made the day. With the wind at his back, Booker T. Washington expanded 
he developed the National Negro League of Business where he encouraged entrepreneurship for African Americans. He believed that that was the way to go, to build economic wealth, get your money right, and then you can move out into more social aspects of the American society. Booker T. Washington's name became gold in the South. Tuskegee was a living monument to what African American people could do. He was educating their children and sending them back into their communities to show them and to teach them how to build self-sustaining communities, all the time emphasizing academics, but also industrial education, building the economy, and becoming important to the economies that they lived in. Booker T. Washington built relationships with wealthy Northerners, including Anna T. Jeans and Julius Rosenwald, who was the owner of Sears and Roebuck. These two philanthropists built hundreds of schools in the South for African American children at a time when they were not guaranteed a public school education. One of the greatest things about Booker T. Washington was that he wasn't spending his time talking about helping black people. He was actually doing it. So now that a leader has risen to the top, there's always somebody to challenge that leadership. And in this case, it was Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. Since his rise to prominence, there was a group of African Americans who thought that Booker T. Washington was not suited for the job. He wasn't strong enough. He wasn't tough enough. He wasn't pushing hard enough for racial equality. So there was that group that really had a problem with Booker T. Washington. But what really set the black liberals off was the speech that Booker T. Washington gave in Atlanta called the Atlanta Exposition and he gave a speech in which he spoke about segregation and not pushing for political, political equity with white people. And this really angered W.E.B. Du Bois and his northern allies. The recurring theme in the speech was cast down your buckets where you are. It was in reference to immigration. He was saying to America, you don't need to bring a lot of immigrants here. You already have workers here. These are people that you already know, and they already know you, so that you don't need to bring in a lot of foreigners. He was appealing to white businessmen, telling them that we will submit to your political rule and be meek and not try to integrate. In return, black people would be assured education and due process under the law. So Booker T. Washington got up. There were black people in the audience but it was mostly white. He got up and gave this very Uncle Tommy's type speech in which he said, as we have proved our loyalty to you in the past, in nursing your children, watching by the sick bed of your mothers and fathers, and often following them with tear-dimmed eyes to their graves, so in the future, in our humble way, we shall stand by you with a devotion that no foreigner can approach ready to lay down our lives, if need be, in defense of yours. And if that wasn't bad enough, it was the next thing that he said that infuriated Dr. Du Bois and the Northern Blacks. He said, in all things that are purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one as the hand in all things essential to mutual progress. In other words, no interracial dating, no integrating, no marrying. We're going to be separate when we are doing our social thing. But when it comes to us doing business and both of us making money, we can work together on that. And so what he's saying is we don't have to integrate. And see, for some black people not being able to integrate, them's fighting words. Many felt that this was what set up that separate but equal Southern policy. Dr. Du Bois and his northern black allies began calling it the Atlanta Compromise Speech, and they accused Booker T. Washington of selling black people out. And this brings us to Dr. Du Bois. Dr. Du Bois 
was a sociologist, a socialist, historian, civil rights activist, Pan-Africanist, author, writer, and editor. Dr. Du Bois was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts in 1868. He was brought up in a racially integrated community and really didn't experience real racism until he came to the South to attend Fisk. His mother was a domestic worker and his father was a barber. His father left home when he was young and his mother died when he was 16, so he pretty much had to make his own way. In Great Barrington, he belonged to the First Congregational Church and they made donations and took up money for him to go to Fisk. But he also worked and his mother also left him an inheritance. So he was able to work his way through Fisk. He also went to the University of Berlin in Germany and then received a PhD degree from Harvard. So he was definitely a man of academia. Dr. Du Bois traveled outside the United States several times and was impressed with the fact that he was treated like a regular human being and not like a black man. Dr. Du Bois was mixed race as well as Booker T. Washington, but they lived in the time of the one drop rule, so they were both considered black. Dr. Du Bois professionally was mostly a college professor he taught at Fisk and at Wilberforce and Atlanta University. He's most noted for being a professor at Atlanta University. I will admit that it's sort of difficult for me to really get a good read on Dr. Du Bois because he was all over the place. I hesitate to call him a study in contradiction, but he did seem to be at odds with himself at times. One minute he's a Christian, then he's an agnostic, then he's an atheist. One minute he's a Democrat, then he's an independent. He's a big time Pan-Africanist, but he's spending a lot of time investigating lynchings and racism in the United States. I realize that they are not mutually exclusive, but you have to focus on something to get something done. It seems like he wanted to do exactly the right thing for black people, but Dr. Du Bois voted for Woodrow Wilson. He is a noted racist. In 1905, Dr. Du Bois was one of the founders of the Niagara Movement, and this was an organization that was formed to fight against racial segregation, discrimination, racism, and disenfranchisement. But one of the main things that they fought against was Booker T. Washington. They did not like his approach to racial progress. They thought he was too um, slow moving, that he was too conciliatory with whites. And so they had this organization. The only thing is, there seemed to have been infighting between him and other members of the group from the beginning. And I think they disbanded soon after they were formed, after which the NAACP was formed, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Dr. Du Bois joined the NAACP, becoming a founding member, and he became the editor of the monthly magazine, The Crisis. He resigned his job at Atlanta University and came to New York to work with the NAACP. Walter White was the executive secretary of the NAACP, he and Dr. Du Bois clashed over how to gain civil rights for black people. So Dr. Du Bois resigned his position as editor of the crisis and went back to Atlanta University to his teaching position. I'm not going to say that Dr. Du Bois was hard to get along with, but it appears that he had some issues, you know, getting along with others. He didn't work well with others. Dr. Du Bois certainly gets credit for caring and for writing about the lynchings and the disenfranchisement and the racial segregation and all of the evils that went with the Jim Crow system. But it just seems to me that he had his eggs in too many baskets. Another issue that I had with Dr. Du Bois was this whole idea of the talented 10th, the 10% of the elite people of the black race leading the masses towards racial equality. That was just so unrealistic 
there has never been a time, I don't think, in the world where the elite cared enough about the grassroots people to lead them anywhere. So that was completely unrealistic to me. The talented 10th. There certainly is a talented 10th, but they don't necessarily care about the grassroots. I find it sort of interesting that he was brought up in Massachusetts and he didn't experience the same kind of racism in Massachusetts that he did in the South. Yet he chose to spend a good portion of his life living and working in the South. In 1943, Dr. Du Bois was fired from Atlanta University with no specific reason given. There were a number of offenses against Dr. Du Bois. He criticized the black church. Atlanta University was founded as a missionary school. He was a snob. His neighbors accused him of being a snob. He didn't want to associate with his southern colleagues, African-American colleagues. And he apparently insulted the president of Spelman College, a white woman whom he accused of not caring about black people or anybody. So Dr. Du Bois apparently was fired for being himself. He returned to New York and rejoined the NAACP. In New York, he was involved in left-wing politics. Eventually, he was indicted by the government. He joined an organization called the Peace Information Center. In this organization, they were working with foreign governments. They were supposed to register this organization with the federal government, and they wouldn't do it. So he ended up being indicted for what the government called subversive activities. The charges were dropped against him, but he continued to be involved in left-wing politics. He was traveling around the world complaining about the United States, about racism and white supremacy, the same things that we talk about today. His lasting legacy, I think, is one of activism and the prolific writing that he left behind. Dr. Du Bois lived a very long life. Uh, he spent the last few years of his life in Africa, dying in Ghana in 1963 at the age of 95. He left behind quite a literary library, including 21 nonfiction books that include The Study of the Negro, The Souls of Black Folk, and The Encyclopedia of the Negro. He's written three autobiographies, one in 1920, one in 1940, and one was published after his death in 1968. He also wrote novels and a number of articles and speeches and recordings. His work, his archival work, can be found at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. We appreciate Dr. Du Bois and all that he contributed to the uplift of the African-American race. May he rest in peace forever. Booker T. Washington also leaves behind a very rich legacy. Tuskegee University speaks for itself. Its curriculum has grown and expanded beyond anything he could have imagined. So has the endowment and the student body. We appreciate Up From Slavery. It is still inspiring and teaching us about ourselves and our history. Booker T. Washington's approach to business was a gift for the African-American community at the time. The relationships that he built with people who were able to actually come in to the South and assist with the education of people who had just come out of slavery. He is a jewel in the African-American crown. And we honor him, appreciate him, and likewise wish him sweet rest forever. Thank you, Booker T. Washington and Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois.